All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the series finale of the Amalthea Group. Uh, we'll talk more about why it's a series finale later, but we're just going to go ahead and jump right into things since it's been a while. Uh, Mirthrin, I believe you have a captain's log to start us off. Indeed. Captain's log, star date 63627.5. The revelations that the USS Venus brought back with it from the Leviathan's home universe are disturbing. The mysterious aliens that Dragon Squad encountered during their mission to re-establish contact with the Alpha Quadrant are not only interdimensional invaders, but ones that have already wiped out another Federation. A more advanced Federation with presumably better resources and technology. They call themselves the Ituic and... And I don't know what to do anymore. The Q entity that's taken an interest in us, she's offered us a deal. In exchange for a completely unknown species, the Zenet, being granted unconditional Federation citizenship, she will prevent any further Itoic ships or individuals from crossing over into our universe. The fact that I'm even considering a deal with the closest thing reality has to a devil scares me, but I'm running out of alternatives. <sighs> Everything's been going from bad to worse since we arrived in the Gamma Quadrant. It's like every time I stop one row of dominoes, I set off a larger row. Maybe Freepak's team can find something in the contract that will give us a clue as to what Andromeda's angle is here. Picard's key was unpredictable, but at least his motivations were obvious. With this one... <sighs> to think that the completion of an interstellar graviton catapult would be the least significant thing on my list. End log. Alrighty. So, uh, we're going to start today's session uh, with Mirthrin in your ready room alone. And Mirthrin, I need to ask you a very important question. So, when the contract was initially brought up, it was you and Admiral Skull in the room. Now, you've indicated that the contract is possibly being looked at by Freepak, but I need to know specifically who has been given access to read the contract at this point, and who have you told? Hmm... Good question. <clears throat> <sighs> I was about to say Drake, but he's not here anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, free puck. Um, actually, probably the Amalthea's command staff. Okay. Okay. And other than them. Uh, anyone Freepak felt necessary to bring in to sort of go over the contract, which probably won't, weren't too many. But... Yeah, probably not, not anyone else, really. If you're already showing the commands now. All right. Well, uh, you have a few moments in that case. Uh, if the command staff of the Amalthea know about it, uh, we'll have a meeting with them shortly. Uh, but is there anything you wanted to do or say or prepare for the meeting with the senior staff? And I should be clear here that it's not going to be with the fleet. It is literally just going to be uh, the senior staff of the Amalthea plus maybe Skull if you want Skull there as well. Yeah, he, he would bring Skull along. Okay. So yeah, as I get that set up, uh, feel free to embellish for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he's mostly just sitting in his raid room, brooding. All right, and he's just trying to think: what would Skull do? What would Drake do? What would anyone except him do? All right. Well. Uh... Pretty much unceremoniously, uh, the terminal next to you does beep and indicates that it is time for you to uh, meet with the senior staff. Uh, you have reserved one of the major conference rooms for this one, uh, the one that you don't actually take the like fleet meetings in, like a, a separate one that you specifically use uh, for Amalthia meetings. Hasn't really seen much use, but uh, you figure it's you know a good point to make that this is a an Amalthea decision and not like a fleet decision. Yeah, so gets the notification, heaves a deep sigh, and then heads out. 
All right. So after a few minutes, uh, you find yourselves uh, in the conference room. Uh, you all know that this is more or less going to be what could be the last meeting before Mirthrin makes his decision one way or the other on the contract. Uh, so now would be the time to speak your mind uh, if you have any opinion on the such. But you all sort of sit down. Uh, there's an awkward silence, and then whoever wants to break it can break it. So, Rupak, did your skim of the contract reveal anything new? Any hint as to what her angle is here? Ah. Uh. I couldn't even begin to guess of what the heck she wanted here. I mean, none of it really makes sense when you think about it. Uh, why Why is she so hell-bent on having this species join the Federation? She could literally click her fingers and boom, they're, done, they're in. There's nothing stopping her from doing that. And then, do you even have the authority to make this call? You're just a captain. Yeah. And then there's the more issues, you know, rule of acquisition 17, a contract is a contract, but only between Ferengi. How can you have no way of, of, of really negotiating with an all-powerful entity that has the ability to rewrite reality? It's not like there's an arbitration council. Well, that's a good thing. That's, a, that's, that's the thing here. You, you need a balance. You, you, this is totally overbalanced in her power. This, this is not a favorable contract, let me tell you. I've written, been on both sides both of those. You need a third uh, arbitration of some sort of other being with relative power to the Q. Where's the dragon when we need him? Does <laughs> The question is also, does this species wish to join the Federation? Cannot force them to join against the will. That brings up a good question. What do we know about the Zanet? Absolutely nothing. They don't appear anywhere in the records, anywhere in Starfleet history. There is an absolute unknown quantity. Well, do we know where they are in the galaxy? Nope. Not even that. Heck, we, don't, we don't even know if they're in this galaxy. Or this dimension. Q is put, placing a lot of bets here on a couple of captains and an admiral being able to sway all of the Federation Council and President to fast-track a completely unknown species into the Federation. And the worst part for me is the contract doesn't actually guarantee a great deal of anything. And it guarantees it our promise, survival. Does it, does it though? It promises us that nothing, no more Iotioch will come through from the Leviathan's universe. But we know they're already here. We've encountered them. Do we actually have any evidence that they ever crossed over and that these ones aren't just this universe's native? Uh, if I had some materials on hand, for maybe some hall fragments, I could give you a better answer, but I don't. Don't we have a sh one of their ships in our cargo hold? I believe we do. Yes. They have, we've had a re research crew sort of analyzing it for the better part of a few months now, but uh, haven't heard anything Isn't back that, from them recently. Wasn't that the, um, the AI caretaker uh, drone? No, we, no we did actually capture one of the drones from the, like, the vertebrae spying QSD ships. Oh, well, then I would definitely take a look at that, if, if I didn't remember that we had that. Well, uh, because I think it was me who dropped the ball here and forgot to give you answers on that. Uh, the quantum signature of that ship was off. It did not match that of your universe. Okay, so, yeah, that, that closes that loophole, at least. Look, following um, Star... Following our protocols on new new species uh, first contact, and for the sake of debate, let's say that this is a first contact situation with the Zanet. We should, uh, if they do express interest in joining the Federation, as much as, as much as we would like to offer them the 
standard he please sign here contract for membership, we're not authorized to do that. That requires them making a case to the Federation Council, several uh, diplomatic envoys back and forth. The contract says that if they, the contract would only take effect if I under, if I read this right, it would only take effect when they join the the council, which could take anywhere from three years to never. Now, the wording is deliberately vague. What we Maybe. need to do, Captain, is come up with a plan to shut down the other dimensions gateway system without Q's intervention. They took out a federation much more advanced than ours. I'm not saying we gotta go over there and fight all of them, but, but if we had a way... Gateway? How can we seal ourselves off? Maybe there's something on that other wormhole planet on the other side. Like, the... the um... Our universe's end is low on power, apparently needs to tap in from to power from the other side. What if what if there was some way we could use the two linked systems to create some sort of barrier or interference? Like m make it next to impossible for them to come through. Next to impossible is still not impossible. But it would give us time to deal with the ones that are already here. I uh, would agree. Although, I have a thought about joining the Federation. Does the contract specifically say the United Federation of Planets, or just the Federation? I'm pretty sure it says it's specifically the United Federation of Planets. Yeah, it's definitely the UFB. And also Starfleet, specifically. All right, there goes that idea. Well, if this Q is so insistent that we integrate this species into the Federation, it would be, I think, our first act of negotiation would be that we could at least meet a representative of this species to understand them. I would agree. I sort of look around, just wondering if Q is listening, and I just wait an uncomfortable period of silence and just shrug and go back to the normal duties. Well, uh, I did want to give Walter a chance to chip in, because I think he's been muted himself this entire time. I don't know if he had anything to add. Nope. Gortig has no clue what to do in this situation, so he's just sitting quietly. Okay, just wanted to make sure. So yeah, uh, actually what happens is uh, Q does show up. Uh, she actually just walks through the door, though, after chiming it. And uh, she says, oh, supposedly you wanted to meet a representative of the species? That would be helpful. Well, you already have. I'm asking sort of... Uh... Look, looks Q up and down. Craig just goes, could you elaborate? I think Mark looks uncertain starting to table. figure it out. <clears throat> and Mother will go, well, she had to take the form from some species. Yeah, bear, bearing a representation of a species does not actually indicate a, a proper representative of the species, Mistress Q, or Madam Q. As we all know, oh, um, no. the Picard's Q masqueraded as a human for many times, but aside from a couple quick incidences that didn't make him so. Well, I mean, apart from that one time where, you get up. Yeah. Well, I like to think it did him some good. I don't think it's going to change your mind any. In fact, it might do the complete opposite, but uh, I suppose it's time I came clean a little bit. I'm not actually a Q. 
I never was. In fact, I just simply masqueraded as a Q because that is the easiest way for you to understand what I am. So at this point, Mithrin actually like swivels the chair to look at her and goes, I'm sorry, what? Yes, you can actually call me Ignatrix. I am a, representat a representative of the Zanette. And there's a slight pause, and I think at that point, Mirthrin actually just leans back and starts laughing. Oh dear, I think I broke him. I'll fix him later. So, Ignatrix, are your species very similar to Q, then? In a cosmic sense, perhaps. I mean, we're not as omnipotent or, shall we say... Uh, heavy-handed let's just say that in order for us to now nah, let's not put it that let's put it this way we follow a set of rules which on the surface might not seem it you know it, it might not seem that we do but we do there's there's a code of laws that we follow and in order to get you to the point where you might allow us to join your federation it was necessary to play up the q angle She was Ooh. bluffing, guys. I should have caught this one. Sorry, my bad. You're losing your edge, free pack. I turned to Ignatrix again. So is your species native to the Alpha Quadrant, or...? No. Uh, it would be very hard for me to describe where exactly we come from. We're not from a specific universe. We're not from a specific dimension. At least not the way that you would understand it. If I had to qualify it... We are from a reality that exists somewhere between the thought and the darkness that exists when there is nothing else, not even time or space. So, you are uh, some sort of interdimensional between realities hoodoo blue lady here. Uh, what exactly do you gain from joining the Federation at this point? Well, for one, we can actually put down roots and settle into one universe. That's kind of the problem for us at the moment is, sure, we have abilities to limit, or not limit, to visit other realities and to interact with them, but most of my species is sort of stuck on... I guess what you would call another plane of existence. It's only a rare few like me that have the ability to come and go as we please. And how would the Federation be able to change that, exactly? As I said, I mean, we, follow... we are very good at punching holes in dimensions, to well, be fair. That and the fact is, again, we follow a very strict set of rules. If you were to sign the contract, then we would essentially... Uh, use that to bring ourselves over. Sounds like I was more on the nose with my captain's log than I realized. Yes, I found that quite funny. The only problem is we alone don't have the ability to grant you membership. As annoying as it is sometimes, these uh, Federation types tend to follow a set of rules as well, if you know what I mean. Let's just say that if you sign the contract, it'll work out. I have a feeling. Now you're starting to really sound like you. Sorry, old habits. I mean, for sure we would be able to find a planet to col that your species could colonize and start the process for the federate to join the federation but i don't see how we alone can get you to join i, I suspect say. this is more of a bypassing the rules sort of deal i have a suspicion if i recall my temporal mechanics correctly that if ignatrix here is as fluent in time and space as she is letting on, and quite frankly I don't see any reason that she's not. She's already seen the um, 
splitting of universes in into multiple timelines that the signing of this contract would start. Well, you've definitely given us a fair bit to think about. I'll leave you to it then. But, uh, you know, I'll just sort of be outside if you need me. And again, not vanishing in a cute flash of light. She just sort of turns around and exits like a normal person. I don't know whether that makes me feel better or worse about the steel. I'm going to need a very stiff drink after this. I second that. Uh, well, uh, free drinks all around. That's one, awfully one generous. Thing, <laughs> I no, do no, think no. we should try have one more go at fixing this on our own. Well, yeah, being yeah. beholden to a uh, very powerful being or race like that uh, definitely gives you the short end of the stick. To be fair, this is basically them asking for asylum. But why? From what? From what? Boredom. Boredom. Themselves. Yeah. But think of the destabilization. I mean, even the advancements that we made a couple of years ago in the QSD destabilized half the, the Alpha Quadrant. You had the Tholians oh. and the all kinds of people rushing to develop into that tech. What happens when they find out that the Federation suddenly has accepted the, uh, a, a member world that is made up of a bunch of reality-bending blue women. Do we what's need to, to disclose that To be fair, we don't know they're all women. And what's to say that once we sign this, their being will become more human and less omnipotent? We have no nothing to say that, that it will once they do, and everything to think that, that it won't, seeing as what we've seen from Ignatrix herself. That's all we have That's the basis have. on. And believe me, the Romulans will find out. They find everything out. <laughs> uh, um, this, if I may make a point, this race this seems race. very bound by rules of laws and obeying their restrictions if we if they join the Federation, they will also be bound by our rules of laws, which includes the prime direction prime directive, which is not something other species, if they join with them, will force them to do. They will be much more restricted in their powers with us than with any other faction in the game. Them joining us might be the best thing. Well, that's a real nice thought there, Mr. Lasagna, but uh, <laughs> rules are good and all for the general people, but let me tell you, there's always an outlier. There's always someone who's just not going to follow them exactly to the letter, who's going to bend it a little bit. And you, 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 we don't understand what their people are like, what their culture's like. I don't, you, I don't think you can trust them at all. I mean, think about how we met her. The very first time we met her, she deceived us. She's been deceiving us this whole time. Maybe not. Maybe the whole point of everything that she's done is to get us to this point. So, that, so you, then you agree that she's been manipulating us? I would say guiding us. We've made great discoveries, had interesting adventures since the first encounter. Maybe I, it was more of a guide and not so much manipulative. I uh, applaud she your skill well, in the spin. Well, think about it. She's never harmed us. She told us information. That's not manipulating us. That's giving us a choice. And the Federation is powered by curiosity and adventure. It was this not an inevitability? When the Federation was founded, there were four humanoid races. Then they found people like me who were raw. They have found enemies who are like the Klingons who have allied. They have people who do not breathe the same atmosphere, who do not eat the same food. Isn't 
not ex um, expected that eventually there would be a Federation member that does not obey the same laws of reality. Sooner or later, there'd be a race like the Organians or the Q or many of the others who are have evolved beyond physical forms, like Jensen's ancestor. Sorry to invoke his name, but only a matter of time before one powerful race joined the Federation. Our jobs are to learn the people around us. The Federation is unified by its differences. There is always going to be an outlier. There's no way of eliminating that. But we are bound by the differences that, but also by what we have in common. We are all curious. That's why we're all here. We all want to explore and have an adventure. Maybe that's what these people want too. And right now and they right can't. Now Gortig, you've been very quiet for the last few minutes. I uh, really have nothing to add to the conversation. I am annoyed by the fact that even in the Federation and allying with them multiple times, granted being enemies multiple times, any Klingon that's in, fe in the Federation or in Starfleet still gets treated like a second-class citizen. And yet, here we are, with someone with more power and more everything, wanting to skirt the system and just walk right in and be accepted. So, yeah, I'm quiet. I'm annoyed. I don't really want to be here when she's around now. Now knowing that she's not what she said she was and what she wants to do for her own people. So, excuse my silence. Yeah, I imagine everyone just sort of mulls over that for a while. Mm -hmm. Well then. Let's well, have can, one more go at stealing. If you want to uh, try to do this on our own, we're going to need to fa fashion some way of shutting down their gateway. I think that would be the best option. Mm. Uh, I assume on their side of things that command center that we have on air would be uh, stationed by their own people. So maybe a, some sort of frontal assault wouldn't be the best idea there. But uh, some way to destroy that command center, I think, or overload their reactors would be the best way. So free pack. I mean, uh, that would only be half the thing. I mean, our wormhole planet was able to pull the leviathan through if we're going to keep them out by neutralizing the system we're going to have to neutralize both ends makes sense to me and yeah free pack uh what you would have learned and i guess mirthran too since you were part of the uh, whole expedition team on the planet there is a protocol omega uh locked within the planet uh you haven't really delved too far into it but Supposedly, uh, if triggered, this will destroy any means of traversal via the gateway on either side. Hey, maybe if we could sort of link those two systems together, set them both off at once? Well, let's say this other side that we're taking power from is indeed this other dimension. Let's assume... For a second, that's correct. The systems at some point would have to be interconnected in order to perform this power transfer. And stuff. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. If we could set up this interlink, maybe we could force the other uh, commands to initiate this protocol Omega. 
Mm. Sort of tie the systems together and then remotely access. I hear you have uh, pretty good them uh, blowing stuff up via remote. Skull smirks. Weeks a weak smile from Mirthrum. I can uh, beam down to the planet and try to start getting my hands into that systems. Uh, I I'd need a team, maybe a couple of a couple a day or two. I'll oh, go with the time. Back. If it's an away mission that's being led from New Maltia, then I'll leave it. Makes right. sense. Hopefully the Marissa won't be too upset when they get out to the planet and find it's not there anymore. Well, they're, they're new to space. They will find several others. It's better than trying to colonize a area of space that's about to be taken over by interdimensional bad guys, don't you think? This is fair. Very well. Sounds like we have a plan. In the meantime, I'm going to have Dragon Squad do a, a recon patrols into the sector of space that where they encountered, what were they, the ITAC? The ATR. The ATR. The ATR. I'm I want to get a sense of their borders and if we can get an estimate of their fleet size without overly provoking them. Uh, all intelligence at this stage is good intelligence. All right. If there's nothing else, I will go. Uh, Skull's going to stand up and leave the room. So, uh, it seems an away mission is in order. Uh, I have Free Pack, I have Gortag, I have Prayer. Uh, I'm guessing Rosazo's going as well. Yeah, uh, gotta keep then, everyone safe. Uh, who am I missing? Who do I not have? Uh, Mirth, uh, remember, I don't have someone for you. And McCall, I need someone for you. Uh, uh, Zenexia would probably make the most sense. Okay. I will... Uh, let me bring along uh, Liru. Liru. All right. And almost done. All right. So, you know, appropriate amount of transition time later, uh, you guys find yourselves back in the control room of the uh, wormhole planet, and it's still sort of a serene, almost like a library quiet as you walk in with all the hollow simulations and all the hollow displays alight and just showing different bits of data as you walk in. Uh, Free Pack will make his way to the main console and he's going to begin looking for a way to establish a connection with the other dimensions uh, gateway systems. Sure, I'd like you to roll me a uh, insight engineering uh, <clears throat> difficulty of two. Hmm. Uh, can Liru assist? Uh, I will say that Liru could assist, but the complication range would become an 18 to 20. I'll let Free Pack do it by himself. He seems capable. Now look at that. You start off with one momentum. Uh, wow. Yeah, actually, Free Pack, uh, good news is it turns out that there is a, I guess you would call it a backup connection to the other side. And supposedly if you're reading this right activating the omega directive or the the uh, omega protocol as it were um supposedly it can use this backup connection that would make sense the beings that have created this multi-dimensional energy gateway system would probably want ways to shut it down from one to the other Uh, how hard would it be to initiate this protocol on Mega? You literally push the big red button. How have we not noticed the big red button until now? 
I mean, I think we did notice it. We were just, you know what? Let's not press that. Well, it's time to press it. And he'll slam his hand down on the holographic representation of it. Hold your butts. <laughs> Liru immediately enters the um, brace position as if on a crashing aircraft, just in case. That are going to be really fantastic or really bad. Let's find out. So, uh, you push the big red button, and immediately all the holographic displays change to a red color. And a timer, or at least what you're assuming is a timer, in an unknown language uh, appears on all of them. And the same sort of uh, distant, incorporeal AI voice says, Omega Protocol has been acted. Please evacuate the star system immediately. Estimated time till coronal collapse is 20 minutes. Oh. Did he say star system? System? That's, that's bad. Free park, uh, immediate emergency beam out. Uh, quick question, how many ships are in system? Well, at the moment, uh, the only thing that's in system is the Amalthea. So you got, well, I guess the Leviathan is there too, unless you move the Leviathan, because it's been a few yeah. weeks between last session and this one. So I guess we need to. I mean, getting that. incinerated yeah. in a supernova would probably be as a way of dealing with it. It's a good Question way of making mind. it disappear. Yeah. I, I mean, we've got twenty minutes. It's not like we can tow it with us. Nope. Yeah, and I'm guessing its systems are pretty much still dead. At this point, you can do rudimentary impulse. I mean, if you told it to go to impulse right now. It could probably make it out of the system. Uh, impulse is like what half life? Uh, a third. Uh, uh, but yeah, we are all getting off of this planet station, whatever uh, we, it is. And yeah, we we do have some engineering crew on the Leviathan, presumably. So radio them and tell them to hit the go forward button. So, uh, that was a short So, so scene, I, I, I'd imagine at some point you need to tell Mithrin who's up on the bridge what's going on. Right, right, right. So, a lot of things happen at once, because this was a shorter scene than I thought, because you guys literally just pushed the button. <laughs> um, so, you gave us a button, man. <laughs> you gave us a button. So, a lot of things happen at once. Uh, this all starts going off. Uh, you tell the... Uh, you basically come up to the Amalthea, tell them, hey, we need an emergency beam out. So we're just going to go to the Amalthea Bridge uh, where all of this is taking place. So uh, Gortek, you're walking in uh, along with Pierre, Rosazzo, etc. Uh, waiting for you at uh, the normal positions are uh, Captain Mirthrin, uh, Hamasi, and Darval. And uh, Mirthrin, all you know that until someone tells you otherwise is that the... Uh, the away team has requested an emergency beam out for some reason or another. And as they're on their way up, uh, Hamasi reports, uh, Sir, I'm detecting some rather unusual fluctuations in the so on the sun of this system. Um, um, in the sun? Gorteg, when he, okay. as soon as he gets out of the turbo lift onto the bridge, uh, Lieutenant Darval, uh, Set yes. heading towards Alexandria Station. Get us out of the system as fast as we can. Punch it, beef steak. Yes, yes, Commander Ridges. I am engaging now. Uh, no, Captain, Captain, apparently Captain. the um, big red button to enact this protocol is going to cause the star to go supernova and take the system with it. We need to not be here in 20 minutes. This engineering crews on the leviathan we well then we, we either need to get them back and let the supernova deal with our problem of the leviathan or we need to try to get them to get that ship out of this system within 19 minutes and 45 seconds yeah, mother and all sort of come through to the whoever's in charge of the repair teams this i'm off here to leviathan this is uh lieutenant commander mendoza what can i do for you sir is there any chance you can get that ship out of the system in the next 18 minutes? Uh, we can get it going towards the edge of the system, sir, but we definitely don't have warp. We've got impulse at best. All right. 
take it to impulse as fast as it can go without uh, without breaking. We'll we'll escort you alongside and start beaming your crew out. Uh, well, sir, uh, I don't mean to tell you what to do, but uh, even though we are a larger ship, if the Amalfia were to uh, lock on to a specific point with the tractor beam, you might be able to tow us a little bit faster. Worth a shot. We've got about 17 minutes before we need to warp out of the system. Captain. Uh, Commander, request permission to transfer to the Leviathan. This ship can... The ship can fly itself. The Leviathan will need all the assistance it can get. Agreed. Back the bridge. Captain Mathrin here, go ahead. I'm going to divert extra power to the to uh, tractor beam and uh, the reinforcement field. And Oh, and the impulse engines. Understood. Divert power away from the weapons. Uh, Lieutenant Rosazzo, uh, rope us a big one. Aye, right, Captain. All right, o Operation Tow the Honking Big Starship Out of System. Mm -hmm. All right, so I need to know uh, a couple things here. So there is, as far as I can read, uh, your tractor beam is a strength five, because apparently when Modifius initially made the tractor beams, they're not supposed to be tied to scale. They are literally the strength it is to break free of the tractor beam. I don't think that's mentioned anywhere, but that's what I've seen, you know, on social media from certain developers of Modifius. Either way, the point I'm making is, is that yours is a strength five. However, uh, even though you have a strength five tractor beam, uh, moving something as massive as the Leviathan is going to take some effort. And to that end, I have to ask you, how much power are you going to be devoting to this tractor beam and to your engines? Um, now your pool of power, if I remember correctly, uh, your pool of power is what a, uh, 15, 11, an 11. So it's actually less than I remember. Um, so you have 11 power to throw around as you wish. And what I'll say is that depending on what power you put, where will affect the difficulty of the tractor beam task and of the pilot task that Darval will have to do on the Leviathan. Damn. Can we launch the Callistos to give us extra tractor beam? Because we can all go through a warp field together, but it, we need everybody moving. I mean, the Callistos are pretty tiny. Right, and that's sort of the problem. Like, if you had the um, the Ophion and the uh, Lysithia here, you could have them help. The Callistos are too small for this instance. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, l l let's pull up what's left of the protocols from when we towed that comet into orbit, see if we can make use of any of those. Well, I, those I hate to be the bad wired. news, but most of those protocols were made with the fact that the Ophion could split into three pieces with the same strength um, tractor beam. So uh, we don't a good really point. have that. Well, yeah, no, well, the Amalfia do... was just acting as the brake. Yes. We could use the Callistos in another way if they landed on the Leviathan and extended their structural integrity field as far as possible, they might be able to reinforce weak areas, allowing us to drag harder. Not a silly idea, actually. Reinforce the key structural weakness points. How many How many of the Callistos would we need to do that? All four? One? All four? Probably all four. There's the nacelle points where the saucer meets the secondary hull. All those places would have experienced torsion. Two, two to each in a cell, then? It is a big ship, and those are very spindly nacelles. We gotta move quick. Mm -hmm. Yep, let, let's get in position and start towing. Uh, I'm going to uh, divert all non-essential power to the tractor beam and impulse engines so i assume like the lighting okay. changes yeah the uh the lighting goes to red alert if it wasn't already um but what i need to know specifically is how are you dividing up your 11 power yeah. uh, big question here is are we going to try and transfer the engineering crew via transporter over to the amalfia or are we just going to put all our eggs in one basket 
I mean, have, I mean, you already have Darval going over to pilot what he can. So that's a good point. Stop him. What if? Oh, yeah. How how many how many crew member members are over there exactly? I would say that since this has been a uh, major project, that probably about seventy percent of your teams are over there. Free pack. Yeah, probably a couple of hundred. That's a lot. How many could the Callistos take? Beam over if necessary. I mean, working at capacity, it would take all the transporter rooms on the Amalthea and all the Callistos beaming. Uh, it would take your remaining time. So we're kind of coming up on the flashpoint. One here. or the you other. Need to make the call. All right, let's divert all power to towing and keeping it together. All right. Uh, we're going to do five power to tractor beam and then the remaining uh, six to impulse. Can Can I ask one quick question? You certainly may. Yeah. You certainly may. Does it cost us any power to go to warp? Uh, I'm going to say that for this, uh, we're not going to worry about actually needing to spend power to go to warp. Um, because even if a supernova does go off, the supernova does not travel at the speed of light. So you have time to... Basically, as long as you're going at full impulse, you'll always outrun the supernova. Okay, that's what I wanted yeah, to ask before down. we dumped all... 10 or 11 of our power and then oh, had yeah. no power to go to work. Yeah, ba basically, we want to make sure we're far enough away that the initial pulse blast of the supernova doesn't catch up. Okay. Um, and if we're diverting power away from weapons, yes? Yep. Okay, then um, Goreteg is going to put all fighter wings on alert in case more crap hits the fan and somebody decides to come into the system to attack us. How much momentum does it take to give uh, to to give an advantage on like a specific thing? Uh, to... You would have to spend two momentum to create an advantage, and you, there would be a task associated with it. But you'd also have to tell me what it is you're trying to create the advantage by doing. Okay, we've only got the one, so. Hmm. All right, so let's break this down. So because you've put uh, five power into your tractor beam, that. Uh, sort of my homebrew thing here, that brings your strength up to a 10. The scale of the Leviathan is a 12. That means that you are looking at a difficulty of 2. And Razazo, it's your time to shine. It's going to be a control security. And the Amalthea will assist you with a structure security. I've got the Amalthea. All right. I'm going to buy a third dice with threat because I can reroll that way. Okay. Um, um, structural engineering for focus. Yeah, because you're definitely uh, using uh, your knowledge of where to tractor in this instance. Could I possibly do a task to like strengthen the uh, tractor beam more with my knowledge from previous hosts of waves and energy? And how it travels through space? Um, I would say you could, but it looks like Rosazo has gotten three successes, which is all he needs. Um, no, only two looks. No, I see one from the Amalthea as well. Okay, there you go. All right. Yep. So you guys get a momentum. And what I'll say is, Rosazo, you pick a point somewhere around the secondary hull that seems like uh, it's not going to put too much strain on the uh, the structure around it. And uh, you begin moving. Now, Prier, since you're at the helm at the moment, are you going to touch the program that Darval left behind? Or are you just going to try and pilot things manually? My con is one, so we're just going to let the program go. Okay. Um, I can always do it, too. Yeah, so Gortag, you also have the option of doing it, if you so wish. Um, I'll give it a shot. We're looking at control and con. You're looking at control and con, and the way this is going to work is it's going to be a little bit different. And this is, again, a little homebrew thing I thought up. So Darval is, at this point, he has reached a control point on the Leviathan. And the best thing about a universe class is it doesn't really have a specific bridge. You can literally control it from anywhere in the ship. But where I'm going with this is that Darval and Gorteg need to roll the exact same number of successes on a daring and a con. Ooh. Oh. 
Okay, this will be fun. So if so, for example, if Darval rolls more successes than Gorteg, then I roll some challenge die to see if the Amalthea is damaged. If it's the reverse, I do the same for the Leviathan. If you both uh, sort of roll the same, then you are completely fine. There's no issue. This may be the only time where we want to re-roll a success. Yeah. Okay. So that was Daring plus Con. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm just going to roll my 2d20. Okay. And before you... Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yep. That's fine. I was going to say I was. Uh, I wanted to establish how much momentum and whatnot was being spent beforehand, but that's okay. Um, so we have two successes from Darval. How confident are you, Gortag, in getting two successes? Uh, I can always spend determination. Um... Darren Khan, I'm at a 13 with uh, focus, so let me put it this way. If I'm still rolling hot like I was on Akagi, I think I've got this. Okay. Nice. Look at that. Mm. And that's all you need. So, uh, with Darval and Gorteg working almost in like unnatural sync, uh, the Leviathan and the Amalthea begin uh, coasting towards the edge of the system. Uh, thankfully, uh, between both your pilot's work and the uh, careful modulation and application from Rosazo on the tractor beam, with a little help from Prier, of course, and with Freepak freaking out in engineering that, oh god, where is all the power going? I'm gonna blow it up! <laughs> <laughs> um, the good news is you make it to the edge of the system, and what happens is not a moment too soon, uh, the sun literally implodes in on itself, and it does not form a supernova. In fact, what your sensors are detecting, and I'll have Hamasi say this, uh, sir, it's not forming a supernova, it's forming quite a large black hole. Oh boy. It really, really meant to get rid of everything, huh? Yes, uh, well, well, so what, what, what's, the, like, is the planet even still in one piece? Uh, as far as I can tell, sir, it is in the process of, it's in the event horizon. Well, I mean, what, and and I'll say this when Freepak, uh, Freepak chimes in, I mean, what better way of getting rid of it, the evidence is if the evidence destroys itself. True, true. Um, and then I'm going to take the coordinates that Darval had already set in, and I will uh, move us in that direction. Okay. So the good news is you guys don't have to worry about falling into the black hole, uh, and as long as you maintain your current course, you'll outspeed its growth. Because even though it's an artificial black hole that has been generated, uh, it does have a set size that it can grow to, but you'll be able to outspeed that no problem. <clears throat> Oh, that uh, resolved itself, I guess. We hope. Yeah, I'd like well, to I mean, see ATR. This is step one. I mean, if we can figure out what the ITOC are up to and like, if that panicked them, we might have our answer if that worked. It's right about then that a uh, certain member of Dragon Squad uh, chimes in and... Uh, oh, hey, look, a chime. <laughs> <laughs> that a, was perfect uh, for timing. <laughs> yeah, a, uh, a member of Dragon Squad does hail the bridge. Dragon Squad, this is Matron. Go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. This is Vinleth here, sir. Uh, we tried to reach Skull. I guess we got routed to you instead. Uh, just make sure this message gets to him. Uh, whatever you did, assuming you did something, we're seeing a lot of movement from the Atioc here. Uh, we're seeing them powering up ships. We're seeing them powering up uh, a, lot, a lot of movement, basically, sir. Okay, I think we have our answer. Uh are they moving in a direction or just mobilizing? Uh, towards you, sir. 
All right, get us back to the fleet. We've got a defense. Or get plan. the fleet to us quickly. Yeah, and Sharp maybe attack. send a message to the Marissa and the, the them jellyfish people. Give them the heads up. Message sent. And, and please tell me you put their actual species name, not them jellyfish people. Them jellyfish people. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Captain. I fixed your political correctiveness. Nice. So I need to know which it is. Are you going to the fleet or is the fleet coming to you? Uh, universe class does not have warp. So well, at this point, because you guys have succeeded on the tractor, you could go to warp. However, I would say you are limited to about warp five. Mm. And aren't we like three days out at warp eight? Uh, napkin I math remember. says you're about uh, a week out at warp five. So the fleet to us, are they coming directly toward us or towards the Mercer homeworld? They are headed directly for where you are at the moment. So where and the they system have USD. True. Uh, fleet to us then, I guess time for a stand in interstellar space. The Ophion and the, um, May you on both have QSD. Lysithia, they can get to us pretty much right away. Yeah, Lysithia does not. Unless they follow us through the QSD hole. Yeah, but that's very dangerous, unfortunately. Yeah, if we're going to be defending, I say we get the, uh, the ships there in one piece. But that also means they're quite a ways out, unless they're got the smoky people, whatever they are, uh, split and attack both places. Well, as, uh, as an answer to your question, Walter, uh, all of you are, you know, debating, well, what do we do next? Uh, where do we go from here? Your favorite buddy in the whole wide world, you know who, Ignatrix, walks onto the bridge and says, hmm, it's a bit bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah, well, we've been taking notes from various places over the years. Hmm. Well, uh, I see you're in a bit of a pickle. Would you like some assistance? In the form of... For free, I will help you in this situation. Vague, but in a non-threatening way. I mean, that's just my nature. Vague or non-threatening? All those in favor? Help how? Let's just say that um, they might not see the black hole. That would be useful. Right into it. Can you shove them all into it? I can obscure their sensors so that they will be unaware that they are in a black hole until it's too late. Wouldn't be the first time we've used a black hole to to deal with a superior foe. Yeah, indeed. In fact, hell, you could call this the Mirth Maneuver 2.0. We are not <laughs> calling it the Mirth Maneuver 2.0. Uh, I'm using my captain's veto on this. Oh, come on, captain. T t tell you what, when you figure out a way to deal with a superior alien fleet without sending them into a black hole, we can name the maneuver after you. I mean, if you would like, I can have the engineers rig up some of the fighters as depth charges and leave them behind us as we're going. I was thinking of calling it not the Gorteg maneuver. Hmm. Sort of like steer them closer to the event horizon, you mean? That's what I was thinking until, well, the blue woman showed up. I think he likes me. I think he Just, likes I have a hunch. No, no, I don't. That was sarcasm. I know. Well, call the fleet and get them in here just in case this doesn't work, but uh, I think we'll take you up on that offer. Very well. She snaps her fingers and nothing appears to happen. Uh, the Atiox ships are still coming in your direction 
And really, until they're on top of you, there's no way to tell if what she says is true. Alright, start, start circling us around the system. Okay. So, and, uh, uh, Gortek, uh, if this doesn't work, get ready to send those fighters out. Doesn't anyone else find it odd that she's offered to help us for free again, even though what we've done essentially invalidates all of the leverage she had for getting her people to join the Federation? I mean, honestly, that actually makes more sense, because uh, we've kind of ne negated your trump card at the moment, haven't we, Ignatrix? I'm glad I don't have to explain it to you, but yes. Oh, I'm, I'm sure we can discuss uh, a more ab above board track for the Zenet into the Federation at a later date, but uh, for now, we're happy for the help. Hmm. I'll be over here. I'm always curious how Rosalzo does what he does. And Initrix literally just starts hovering around Rosalzo. I have the screen pulled up to display things in infrared. I use my robot arm. <laughs> Go about showing her how I... She listens with rapt attention. But yeah, uh, long story short, uh, the Ophion and the Mei Yuan show up in QSD very quickly. Uh, they take up defensive formation. And, uh, you know, there's, again, a moment of tension as the Atioc fleet comes within range. But apparently, instead of going to you, they continue towards what they perceive to be. Uh, the planet that you just kablooied, and one after another, uh, both Rosazo and Hamasi uh, see that, uh, yeah, sir, they're flying right into the black hole, like, beelining into it. Mm. It's like picturing that scene from Fury Road where the car gets pulled up in the tornado. Mm -hmm. just mutters, I wonder how that feels. Sorry, they're f they're flying yeah. right into the black hole. Yep, because they think that's where the planet is. Be spaghettification. They wouldn't feel anything. Time was slow to them. Yep. I mean, basically, yeah, basically, by the time they realized what was going on, they wouldn't even be able to start pulling away. Ophion to Amalthea. Amalthea here. Go ahead. With your permission, Commodore. The Ophion will hold back to prevent any stragglers that if there are any of returning agreed let's make sure that make sure that's all of them and then we'll figure out what we're doing from here very well commodore ophion out and then ophion will cloak and then disappear okay. all right yeah i keep forgetting the ophion has a cloaking device mm -hmm. yeah they do all right, well, with the crisis seemingly averted for the moment, you actually have a moment to catch your breath and not have to worry about some looming big decision. It feels liberating. How many more buttons to push? <laughs> no, unfortunately, the only button that remains is the uh, the catapult, which incidentally, uh, Mirthrin, like 10 minutes as you finally take like a breath and you get a fresh cup of joe, uh, you do get a hail from uh, Alexandria Station. Hello, Alexan Alexandria Station. This is Captain Mirthrin. Uh, yes, sir. This is uh, Commander Deer of Alexandria Station. Uh, you wanted to be notified, sir, when the Graviton Catapult was ready for activation? Uh, remind me to stop for a cup of coffee after you, you and tell you just how incredibly good your timing is. Hmm. Should we expect you, or let me say this differently, should we delay the activation until you've arrived, sir? I believe it was uh, something you had asked specifically. Yes, we should be there within the next few hours. Very good, sir. It was a week at work five. Yeah, so about a week. Okay, All right, well, we should be there within a week. Very good, sir. We'll just uh, run some extra system checks. Alexandria Station out.
And yeah. And I think at that point, Mirthrun, like for the first time in a very long time, just sort of like slumps back in the chair and actually looks relaxed. Uh, Captain? Yes? Uh, uh, and Gortek will like play or pretend like there's something on his screen. He'll even nudge Prier and get him to look at it. And and on the screen, it just basically says, go with me on this. Um, Captain, there's something very important that uh, I think you need to go do. Uh, it's really very, very important. What? Problem in engineering or something? No, Captain. I believe you need some rack time. And if I need to, I will have Commander Prier order it. I just give him a big, big, big grin. Yeah, Mirthrin goes to object and then thinks better of it and goes, then just sort of smiles and gives a nod of acknowledgement to Gortek. And Gortek will get out of his chair and say, Captain, I've, I've got the bridge. I, I don't expect to see you on the bridge for a minimum of six hours. I will be in my quarters. And, uh... Ignatrix, I guess when I wake up, we'll talk about introducing you to the Starfleet diplomat. Oh, of course. I'll just be here. Again, I find this entire horde of thing fascinating. The horde of well, thing has a name. He is Rosazo. I didn't mean that. It like your language is limited. Your language is limited. <laughs> And Mirth Mirthrin gives a winning smile and starts walking out. I've often felt the same thing about their language. I know, right? And Do you also it. communicate through smells and infrared light? And yes, uh, actually, she begins conversing with your Zazo in your quote-unquote native tongue. Yes. I teach her the wonderful world of... Yes, of smells and of horda things that the others could only dream of. Oh dear! All right, Jester so. gets bullied into another romance. <laughs> oh god! Um, well, that's a thing. So no, uh, you. So as I said, you guys basically have a week before you arrive to launch the catapult, and this is sort of me saying if there's anything you want to resolve as a character before you arrive and activate the catapult, now would be the time to speak up. Uh, I think Mirthrin would definitely like to sort of stop by Gorteg at some point. Sure. So... Uh, where, where would Gorteg be in a day's time? Um, unless Prayer orders him to not be there, probably on the bridge. Mm -hmm. Now nah, I'll be kind. <laughs> we've, we've been through this before. <laughs> Uh, so I'd imagine yeah, just yeah, the, the next time they're on regular shift, they're okay. all sort of at some point just saying passing. So Cortex, just out of curiosity, how many times would I have been shot for incompetence by this point on a Klingon vessel? For in incompetence, I I don't I don't think any. Uh, I think there may have been a few times that. A member of the command staff or a captain from another ship uh, may have challenged you to the captaincy of a ship of this size. Hmm. But I assure you, if that would happen, that I would step in and make sure that you stayed as the captain of this ship. Hmm. Oh, that's actually really reassuring. Either myself or Rosazzo. I don't believe anyone can would be able to defeat us, especially now that well, I mean, the Marines work for you now, so. <sighs> this has been an extremely stressful tour of duty. Yes. Yes, it has. I, I long for the day when the only worry I had was killing Jim Hadar. Uh. Or as terrible as it was, the Dominion War was a simpler time. It was easy. You knew who the enemy was. You knew they were over there and you were over here. 
unlike here where every time you go somewhere new you don't know if it's an enemy or someone that's going to offer you safe harbor oh well, that's the human influence for you true though i will say if he is still around there is a certain Klingon captain that I would very much like to introduce his skull to a bulkhead. I'm sure he's still floating around somewhere. With his stupid glasses. <laughs> uh, All right. Next uh, scene. All right. So that's what Mirthrin wanted to do. Uh, who's next? Who would like to go next? Hmm. Doesn't have to, doesn't need to be a full scene, but Skull would like to have the senior staff of the Amalthea over for dinner. Oh yeah, we've always wanted. He always wanted to do that. He did. He always wanted yes. to do it, and we just never had it happen. So yeah, we yeah. we kept having to deal with this thing or the other. So sure enough, uh, you gather all the senior staff of the Amalthea together and. Just out of curiosity, uh, is it Skull that's cooking, or is uh, is it Vetu that's cooking? Uh, it would be Vetu that's cooking because of all his hosts, Skull has ze- the Skull symbiote has zero cooking skills. Ah, I see. And what is on today's menu? Probably a a wide variety of Federation dishes on a couple meals that have been in- introduced from the Marissa. One or two of which might include cooked tribbles. I was going to say, does that include fried tribble on a stick? (laughs) No, that only happens at street fairs. (laughs) Uh, I'd imagine they'd be very simple to cook. Very simple. Uh, The question becomes, where does the stick go? You don't want to know. Do you you shape them first? These are all questions you're just asking Vet to, and she's like, "I don't know." <laughs> you just sort of you sort of split them open like a mandarin. Mm. <laughs> so I I I think that there would actually be two skull dinners. The first will be just the senior staff of the Amalthea, with all the dinners or all the whatever meals that can be offered. The next one will be all the captains of the fleet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Free Pock holding a champagne flute leans into towards Preer and he says, uh, "She didn't even pre-chew the gree worms." Ugh. I don't know that I want to eat pre-chewed food, Free Pack. You don't know what you're missing. Yeah, save your jaw muscles. Let me just tell you, you'll be, you'll thank me. I'll give my skull muscles or my. Uh, I'll give him a workout. It's good for him. This whole conversation most hard to trans. We poor to have no word for chewing or jaw muscles. Does the do, does the Horta language contain anything similar to the word dissolve or violently dissolve? That that is what it is translating. That makes sense. We have the the word for dissolving for the purpose of sustenance loosely translates as true. At the moment, I just imagine that everyone's having dinner and uh, the Horta is just sort of sprinkling himself with various rock salts. So, <laughs> up on so the including table. the salt shaker. Yes. Wait a second. So, we're all enjoying the smell of the food, but it, I guess it's like a whole conversation for you, right? It, the closest uh, uh, when I went to a banquet was I thought that was what uh, an opera was the first time or a rock show hey. although human conversation has been proved most difficult at first for us we um the first time someone told me they wanted yeah I want he wanted me to come over to chew the fat I was very confused I can see that uh, uh after, both, oh, sorry go ahead it's both fascinating and, and absolutely repulsive at the same time very much so this is some lovely salt 
Uh, Skull will tink his glass and propose a toast to the sen- to the senior staff of the Amalthea, who, well, in game time, how long has it been since we landed in this neck of the woods? Well, uh, you came out here uh, approximately a year and a half ago, if Stardates are be- to, be- to be believed. All right. Uh, to the crew of the Amalthea, uh, we've been stranded out here for a year and a half, but it really hasn't seemed that long. And one only has to look at the relationships that we have built within ourselves and with those around us to see why the time has passed so smoothly. I don't know when we will be seeing Federation space again. It might be tomorrow, test willing, or it might be a several years. But I can't think of a better group of people to spend the time with than those sitting at this table and around our fleet. Here, here. Now, who's ready for dessert? Depends on what's for his dessert. Uh, as long as it's not more triples. No. no. Uh, the Mocklins mm-hmm. do not seem to have a sweet tooth. Mm-hmm. Or, Thrill sort of hold up the glass and go to triumphing in the face of adversity. I'll drink to that. To the triumph. Alrighty. And apparently and now I'm hungry because my stomach's like, ooh, they're talking about food. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, all right, so that's what Skull does. Um, let's see who's next. Uh, Gortag, did you have anything particular you wanted to do? It doesn't have to be with Gortag. It can be with no. really any um, of your characters. So, nope. Uh, I have no. Um, I I have no scene like scenes. Just um, I guess after the dinner, Gortag is gonna pick up his family and go for a walk across the promenade slash boulevard, whatever we're calling it, um, and just basically be seen and enjoy time with his family and the other people around the ship. Noted. All right. Uh, Prior, anything you want to handle? I'll be, I'll invite Jensen out to dinner just to, you know, as friends. So uh, it turns out uh, that uh, when Jensen shows up to wherever you've invited him, uh, he's got a date. And the date is none other than a certain Dabo girl that uh, Darval was crushing on. Nice going, Jensen. Oh, how the turns have tabled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a pleasant evening. Uh, Jensen is actually quite the gentleman. Uh you know, does uh, everything that a, not a nice guy, because quote unquote nice guy is a negative term these days, but, a, you know, like a, a considered individual would do. Uh, he has chivalry. Term. Exactly. Like, he's very chivalrous towards his date, towards you. Uh, very, he's very active in the conversation. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very pleasant evening. I'll say that much. Constantly asking people to duel him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, like we see in the background that we just see Darval walk by and do a double take, like, aw. Darval oh, Kill Bill Siren stock blaring. Just a little bit. All right. Yeah. So that's what Prier does. Uh, we already handled Darval and Skull. Well, did Darval have anything? Because now we just handled Skull. Um, Darval doesn't. I want to have a quick two liner thing with Commander Ty on the Lysithia. Sure. All right. Um, it is a holodeck battle simulation and she is uh, uh, phaser fire going on in the background you two flank left you two go right and don't you dare stun the hostage that's the captain being held hostage we need him in prime physical shape to lead the rest of this combat oh please someone come and rescue me (laughs) whatever will I do being held hostage (laughs) This is terrible. Oh, my. These cuffs on my hands, they are too tight. It would be a shame if I just... Computer, command override, unlock the... Unlock these shackles. <laughs> they do. He sits back, opens up, opens up a beer. All right. Can, can we get this over with? I'm, I'm supposed to be on the Amalthea for a dinner, like, oh, crap, 20 minutes ago. Captain, Captain, Captain. Yeah. Come on, hurry up. Let's go. Let's go. 
computer and program. <laughs> that had to happen. Uh, I, I yes, saw it, it coming a mile away, and I'm like, this is perfect. Alrighty. Uh, Jester, so Rizazo or any of your characters, uh, anything you'd like them to have? For final scene? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm blanking. That's okay. Uh, what do you got going on, Free Pack? Or any of your characters there, Deku? Uh, I'd like to wait for a moment till the captain is off duty and in his quarters, and then I'd like to go chime his door. Uh, which captain? Uh, Mirthrin. Mirthrin, okay. So yeah, uh, so, Mirthrin, yeah. you're Mirthrin. enjoying some downtime in your quarters when there's a chime at your door. Come in. Free Pack will step in and uh, kind of give the place a look over, and you know, you know, you know, uh, I can give you the name of a pretty good decorator. You, you know, uh, no charge, no surcharge, finder's fee. Uh, that, that one's on me. <laughs> I'll put it in the back pocket for later. I really haven't had much time to think about decorating the place. What with everything that's been going on. True, true. Lots have been going on. Uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, you remember that time that I uh, stopped that singularity from exploding, thereby saving a portion, if not all of the fleet, from uh, being sucked into a Romulan-induced black hole? That was a pretty cool one. I do remember that, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff that happened like that. That's pretty cool. And then I will just kind of nonchalantly slide a data pad over to the captain across the, his standing desk. Uh, those are, are um, take a look. those are uh, <clears throat> those are transfer papers, sir, to the starbase of Alexandria. Uh, with your permission, uh, I'd really like to stay behind. Mm-hmm. And there's See, also looking sort of nod and understanding. Hmm. We've got a phrase. Uh, I'm sure you've gotten quite tired of me throwing them around, but uh, you know, uh, he who uh, invests early profits the best. And this is a whole new area that, quite frankly, I think needs a little bit of the Ferengi touch. I mean, we've already got our space set up here, set up here, a couple of new uh, locals to make way. friends with. Well, let's put it this way. There's going to be a th- on, on tr- enterprising Ferengi turning up here sooner or later, no matter what we do. And he'll start signing off the transfer papers. It may as well be someone who I know can do good work. Oh, uh, you, you, you don't know what you're doing, Captain. You, you're, you're really you're setting the sector of space up for, for success, let me tell you. I've got <laughs> wide ideas for this whole place. And as Freepak sort of heads off, Mersman will sort of lean back and think, oh, mate, I wonder if that's a better or worse idea than the Ignatrix deal. <laughs> so, uh, the last scene we'll have uh, before we do the uh, catapult scene is, uh, if you will imagine, uh, one of the smaller little cafes or one of the smaller sort of uh, holes in the wall, quote unquote. Uh, there is Mr. Garrick uh, sitting there at a table uh, having a drink when uh, the camera, as it were, a figure steps in and asks to sit down next to Mr. Garrick. And Garrick says, mm-hmm. well, of course, Mr. Drake. I was wondering when you'd come to say hello. Dun, dun, Drake dun. will sit down at the table next to him, set his drink on the table. You know, you were right all those years ago. It's... Much easier to get your job done when you're dead. Well, I mean, I thought I was very clear on that. The the more people that know about you, the harder your job is as a spy. True. And uh, thanks for that last second beam out. That was really cutting it close. Oh, not to worry. I'm sure you can repay the favor someday. I'm sure you and I are going to have lots of adventures on this side of the galaxy. Hmm, indeed. Speaking of, did you know that uh, the Ferengi is thinking about staying on the station? Hmm. 
I think you're pretty proficient in dealing with um, Ferengi and getting them to do what you want. Mm, true. Uh, I'll have to go talk to the kid. I think he'll be of a big help to us in what we want to do out here. Mm, another uh, cork situation, I believe. Well, he's already setting one up, so why not? Hmm. I like the way you're thinking. Oh, and just for giggles, I got you this. And uh, it is literally a tombstone, like a small, like eight and a half by 11 tombstone that has like Drake's name on it, his supposed time of death, etc., etc. And Garrick says, I understand that humans love gag gifts like this. I don't know that you could put it on a wall, but have it anyway. Thanks. I uh, I didn't think I was actually going to get one of these. Well, if and, it matters, uh, your service was quite lovely. Well, I'm I'm sure I'll get to see a recording of it sometime. Actually, there's a hollow recording embedded in that tombstone. Oh, well then, I think I have my uh, my night planned out. And he'll stand up and take his drink, kind of tip it to uh, Garrick, and walk out of the little bar. All right. Drake, you rat bastard! I never liked you. <laughs> All right. So the final scene of uh, our game is going to be uh, you guys arriving in the Suathia system uh, at the catapult, and uh, the catapult has been fully constructed. Uh, it is large enough to uh, accommodate even the Leviathan, if you so wished. And uh, at this point, uh, a very important question is asked, and this is a general question that can be answered by anyone. Which ship or what ships are going to be sent back to the Alpha Quadrant? Uh, Lysithia uh, gets first pick, I think. Yeah, the Lysithia uh, definitely, um, uh, in any meetings, Beckett will like grill to be the first one um, to go through. Even using the fact that the Lysithia has probably the best sensors out of the entire fleet to make sure that the path is okay for everybody else. I mean, the Lysithia has the most mileage on her already, so it makes sense. <laughs> and True. I, I feel like, True. do we want to send the Amalthia back through? Because we've got the biggest civilian complement. Well, if Lysithia, or if Lysithia makes it through successfully, then... The civilians oh. have waited a year and a half, so they can wait another. That was something I forgot to tell you guys. So the catapult can only fire once every three thirty three point five days. And that recharge time is because it has to re-pool up its reactors um, and sort of capture energy from the sun. So you can fire about the same time every month. More or less. It's a few days extra. Um but what matters is is the is the window lines up with your Midas array broadcasts. Aha. Uh -huh. It's definitely a one at a time sort of deal. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I forgot to mention um, is that technically the Leviathan, it could hold every ship in the fleet and still have room. Oh, can, can you imagine the look on Starfleet's faces if we turn up in that? I, that's why I wanted to give it as an option if you literally wanted to show up and deploy the fleet from a universe class. All right, so all those like in favor idea. of making every admiral in Starfleet fall backwards in their chair? Especially the admirals that sent us on this expedition to get rid of us. Oh, uh, so oh check out what that, we that would be beautiful. Um, well, if and, it doesn't work, we all just end up splattered. Yeah. I mean, it's a good way to end the series one way or the other. <laughs> I mean, we all we all went in together. We might as well go out together. So uh, before so we I, do I, this, I guess what I guess do we want to just send a, a cryptic message ahead saying USS Leviathan inbound? Can we call it the please USS Shawl, please? <laughs> USS Shawl. I was going to have the May you on stay back, but now I'm more interested to see what happens when we get through. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so serious question though: Do we want to rename the Leviathan? Uh, well, what would we name it? Uh, uh, if I may make the recommendation, we rename it to the USS Vanguard. 
I was just thinking the exact same thing. I like it. Vanguard dash G. Uh, yep. Done. done. By authority All invested right. in me as the ranking admiral. This has now been rechristened. The USS the USS Vanguard. Yep. G. Uh, G. Yes. Vanguard G. Yeah. I mean, the G is silent like an Enterprise D. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, is it is it okay if I get dibs on the sending the message ahead? By all means, Captain. Yep, go for it. Mm-hmm. Go for it. All right, so we'll sort of get in position, wait for the Midas array to line up, and then Merthyr will sort of establish communication. Come in, Midas array. This is Captain Merthyr of the USS Amalthea. This is uh, Earth Space Doc. Go ahead. All right, uh, attention, please clear all ships from the far end of the Graviton Catapult destination. We are coming through in the USS Vanguard in, what's the travel time for the Graviton Catapult? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's go with that. Uh, please cl- please clear the destination for the destination area for the Graviton Catapult. The USS Vanguard is in, will be in transit shortly. I'm sorry, Amalthea. You said the USS Vanguard. We do not have any record of the ship on our sensor or not in our database. Have you built something? It's newly. Here? You could say that. Very well. We are clearing the area. You may transit when ready. All right. And Mercer will sort of, sort of look at Gorteg and give a nod. Hi, Captain. Uh, information being sent to the rest of the fleet and being sent up to Darval, commanding the uh, Vanguard to push out when ready. All right. So the uh, final image we see is uh, all the ships getting uh, inside the uh, Vanguard G. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of room in the Vanguard G. It's a universe class. It's a scale 12. It's big. Um, and it sort of lines up with the catapults. Uh, the catapult lances out from either side of the structure and flings the Vanguard G uh, into null space and towards Earth space dock. And sort of as a cheeky end, the moment you arrive, not only is coffee spit across the table into Admiral Janeway's face, but uh, more than one admiral literally loses their shit. And it, it's quite hilarious. <laughs> But uh, that is where we're going to end the session. So before we uh, drop off here, uh, players, we are going to talk after the session off stream. Uh, But for those of you who are, uh, you know, sort of listening in on stream, I did have a few words I wanted to say. Um, So first and foremost, uh, I wanted to thank not only uh, my players, but uh, to each and every one of you, uh, viewer, patron, commenter, etc. Because... Pretty much without any of you, none of this would happen. Um, This group has been probably one of the best ones I've had in all my tabletop gaming career. And we've produced over almost eight days of like straight content of Star Trek Adventures over the past two and a half years. And it's been phenomenal. Um, Now, some of you are probably wondering why Amalthea is coming to a close. And there is no real easy answer for me. Um, What I can tell you is... As a GM, again, I've been doing this for almost two and a half years straight. And with all the games I've been running, uh, I think I've sort of reached a point where I've run almost all the Star Trek Adventures ideas that I had in mind uh, that don't really involve like a bunch of railroading or like tedious combat. So I would rather end on a high note and on a note that is, you know, at least somewhat agreed upon and gives people time to you know, handle characters, things of that nature. Um, So the good news, though, is something that we're going to still discuss as a group. Now, my hope is that we will continue to run something in this time slot with this same group. It might not be Star Trek Adventures, and it might not be with me in the GM chair, but my hope is that we will still stream in this time slot, uh, and it will be a game of some sort, and, and that is my hope. Uh, but we'll have to see how things work out. And my best advice on that is to watch social media 
and see what happens. So again, I wanted to say thank you to everyone involved. And with this, this is ELH signing off. Good luck, Godspeed, and goodbye.